but this is question five of the entire exam or entire temp phys section. It says, what functional group transformation occurs in the product of the reaction catalyzed by the sodium NQR? And so if you have to go back to the passage, we see that it's a transmembrane protein, right, that catalyzes the reaction between NADH and ubiquinone. Uh, so what's, what this hints at is that uh, NADH, right, they take the electrons off of NADH and they ultimately pass it on to ubiquinone. So um, occurs in the product. So the product is the ubiquinone. And what actually happens is the ubiquinone becomes a ubiquinol when it takes on those two electrons. And because I can't really draw ubiquinone, um, I actually decided to steal a picture off the internet. And what you notice between ubiquinone and ubiquinol are these two groups right here. You'll see that the ketone essentially becomes um, uh, an alcohol, right? <coughs> or these, uh, these hydroxyl groups. So we're going to be looking for an answer where we see a ketone become an alcohol, and the only answer where we see that is actually A. So we have the ketone group right here, and it eventually turns into an alcohol. Um, that is the functional group transformation that, that is occurring. Now these other reactions here are actually um, wholly different. So the first one here, this is actually um, a phosphate group that's leaving, right? And this is type of hydrolysis, and it's done by a phosphatase, so it's not B. C shows us we do see a ketone, and it looks like it's going to be turning into an alcohol, but don't be fooled. What's actually happening is you actually have a protein, um, a peptide bond that's being hydrolyzed into not an alcohol, but a carboxylic acid and an amine on top of that. That's what's happening here. So we know C can't be correct. So this is um, uh, catalyzed by a peptidase, since this is peptide hydrolysis, a bond hydrolysis. And D, um, you'll notice this is actually an ester, and what's happening is they're hydrolyzing the ester, and this is, this is catalyzed by an enzyme called an esterase, so it can't be D. So we know the answer has to be A, since again, the passage tells us that we're making ubiquinone into ubiquinol. It says, what is the chemical structure of a component found in four of the five cofactors used by sodium NQR? Um, it tells us in the passage what these four out of five um, molecules are, and it's flavin. Flavin, flavin, the redox active center found in four of the five cofactors of Na plus NQR. Um, so we're looking for the structure of flavin, and you know, this is where I say there's no such thing as high low yield anymore because this, uh, these, there's a lot of questions from what I've seen that ask you about structures, and so it is important to memorize the structures of certain compounds now, um, flavin being one of them, and immediately you should know that this is B. Um, this is just a discrete. If you know what flavin structure is, it's going to be B. Um, this, you'll notice, this is, uh, well, it's not the correct answer, but this is the structure of the adenine base. This is actually ubiquinone that we just talked about, right? The carbonyls, the ketones right here, this is ubiquinone. And this is histidine, so you should know uh, your amino acids very well, and if you do that, you'll notice this is actually histidine, and it can't be a flavin. So um, this is just a discrete, you should know the structure, and this is the structure of flavin, the flavin cofactor. Let's take a look at the next question here. It says, what is the ratio of a cation to enzyme in the spectroelectrochemical experiments described in the passage? The passage shows us that the concentration of this enzyme was 0 0.75 millimolar, and the concentration of each uh, cation was 0 0.15 molar. See, these are the cations they're talking about. Um, here they are actually on the, on the table. These are the cations. So what is the ratio? We have 0 0.15 molar. And we compare that to 0 0.75 millimolar, and you should know the conversion becomes 0 0.75 times 10 to the negative 3. So if we change this into standard units, you basically have 15, um, well not standard units, but more digestible units. You have 15 to 75 times 10 to the negative 3. And if you do it like this, 75, negative 3. You'll notice this is equal to um, something like 1.5 times 10 divided by, or actually, an easier way to do this would be, this is equal to 150, so just multiply the numerator and denominator by 10. 150 divided by 75 times 10 to the negative 2 that becomes 2 over 10 to the negative 2, which is equal to 
200 over 1. So the ratio will be 200 to 1. You know, you could have done this anyway, um, as long as you eventually reach um, this, this ratio right here. Oh, wow. That's not what I meant to do. As long as, you reach, as long as you reach this ratio right here, there's really quite a number of ways you could have gone. Um, but eventually, you should reach a calculation um, that leads you to 200 to 1 as your final ratio. So the answer here would be, oh, this is pretty difficult to navigate. Let me see if I can get back to the question here. I'm going to have to disable the, uh, this feature. Anyways, the answer uh, leads you to, to D. Just make sure you calculate these carefully. Make sure you're using the exponents carefully. Make sure you're doing the divisions, the multiplications, all of that very carefully. This is a, this is a very um, straightforward question. You don't want to miss points on questions like this. This is the last question of this passage, and it says, the reaction between NADH and ubiquinone is exergonic, right? So it's exer uh, it's spontaneous, right? It's going to be releasing energy. But the reaction, when catalyzed by this enzyme, does not generate much heat in vivo. So what factor accounts for this different difference? The reaction catalyzed by, the, by this enzyme in vivo, blank. A, is more exothermic as a result of lower activation energy. Um, yeah, so when you do have an enzyme, it does lower the activ activation energy, but it's not going to change. Um, the enzyme itself doesn't change how much heat is being released, right? Uh, and even if it were the case, if it did release more heat, um, it's more exothermic, then we would expect more heat to be generated in vivo. But we know from the question stem that it does not generate much heat in vivo, so A is incorrect. Um, occurs sequentially in several small steps. So this is invalid um, because of Hess's law. So if you don't know exactly what Hess's law is, make sure you go ahead and brush up on that. Um, but Hess's law basically tells us that when we add up the heats um, of small steps, we'll eventually be able to find um, that gives us the total heat of a reaction. So even if we, you know, even if we were to break down this reaction into small steps, each of these steps, when we add up the heats of each respective step together, it's going to uh, give us the, the final heat, and that final heat should be equivalent to if this reaction just happened in one step. So let me just illustrate this out a little further. Let's say we're going from point A to point B, and it releases X amount of heat. Well, instead of going from point A to point B, let's say we split this up into small three smaller steps. So A, A1... A1 to A2, and A2 to B. Well, if we look at the heat that's being released by each of these steps, if we add it up, well, the sum of these heats will, according to Hess's law, add up to X. So in other words, it doesn't matter if this reaction happens in several small steps. In theory, um, the heat should be exactly the same, regardless of whether or not this reaction occurs in small steps or just one step. So B is incorrect. The reaction catalyzed in vivo maintains large separation between the reacting centers. Um, there's two reasons why this is wrong. Um, number one, normally if you have a reaction that's occurring in various steps, you want these reacting centers, let's say each of these circles is a reacting center, to be very really close, right? So let's say you have a reactant A, it becomes B, and let's say B needs to act as the reactant for this second reacting center, so you make C as the other product, and C as the reactant for this one to make D as the final product. Um, if each product serves as a reactant for the next um, reacting center, what you want is these reacting centers to be close to each other. If they're far away, the, the product has to travel quite far. It's going to have to travel far to, be, to become the product for the next reaction. So normally when biology, when we have several reactions, like chain reactions like this, where you have um, one product serve as a reactant for the next reaction, these enzymes or these reacting centers are actually very close to each other so that we're very efficient and the product immediately becomes the reactant in the next step. Um, so we normally don't wouldn't find that these enzymes are or the, the these reacting centers have large separation. And even if they did have a large separation, it's not going to explain to us why there's a lot of heat uh, being lost in vivo or why there is no not a lot of heat um, in vivo in, in the first place. The distance between each reacting center is not going to really tell us a definitive answer as to why this enzyme does not generate a lot of heat in vivo. So for those two reasons, C is wrong. Reasons the C is wrong. Let's look at D. It's coupled to the movement of a charged particle particle against the concentration gradient. Remember, this, this whole enzyme, what it does is, yes, it you know moves around electrons, but what it does also do, it moves sodium molecules against the concentration gradient, right? 
So what does this mean? What you're doing is you're pushing this sodium ion into an area with a lot of sodium ions. And what we know from biology is that this is um, thermodynamically unfavorable. In other words, this is something that requires energy. It's like when you're trying to move a boulder up a hill, um, it's going to require a lot of energy to move it up a hill. This is the same thing. You're trying to move this sodium ion, the boulder, up the hill to the top to a region that has a lot of sodium ions already in it. Um, so what, what does this mean? This is an uh, endergonic reaction, this itself, and you need energy to supply this movement in the first place. Well, where is this, where is this energy coming from? This energy is coming from the NADH and ubiquinone reaction. Okay, So this actually releases energy when, um, according to this, this question stem here, it says the reaction between this two is exergonic, so it's, really, it's giving us energy. And normally, if this was it, if this was the end of the story, this energy actually just kind of dissipates off as heat. Remember, heat is, is, is how this energy would normally manifest. However, this reaction is actually coupled to this, this movement right here. So this energy, instead of going off as heat, it's actually going to be used here as a supply to move the sodium ions against the concentration gradient. This is where the energy is going. So instead of being left off as heat, because it's being used in another process, you're not going to get a lot of heat um, in, in this reaction. So that is why you're not getting a lot of heat in vivo. This energy is being used um, for another process that we know that this enzyme is responsible for, and that is D.